Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Uh, let's pray together and ask God to be part of uh, what's happening in, in this place today. God, we, we recognize that we come here to, to gather together as believers, not only to worship you, but also to open up your word and to hear truth from you. I pray right now as we have this time set aside specifically to open up your, your Bible together as a family, that we would be able to see out of it what it is that you want us to learn about ourselves and about you, and that we could be more like you because of it. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, good morning. Uh, happy to see all of you here. For those who don't know me, my name is Matt. I serve as the lead pastor here. And uh, one of the things I get to do most often on Sundays that I really love is to teach out of this book. Uh, we at Arundel Christian Church, you might not believe like we do yet, and that's okay. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, but we believe that this is the Word of God and that we can count on the things in it, that what it says is true. Um, so we, we, tie, we try to take some time every Sunday uh, we do take time every Sunday to teach out of this book, and uh, we want to invite you into that. So if you'd grab your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, we got you covered underneath the chair in front of you. There's a Bible, and if you don't even own a Bible, uh, we want you to write your name in that Bible and take it home with you. We want you to have a Bible, okay? So everyone in this room is the owner of a Bible. You can turn to page 408 if you're using one of our chairback Bibles, um, so we'll all be on the same page together. In Isaiah chapter 6. But here, uh, here, here's what I want you to, to catch you up. If you haven't been part of this series, if you've been away traveling or, or whatever, uh, we are in the middle of a series called Transformed. And we've been looking at how God wants to transform us. Uh, regardless of where you are in your journey, God is in this process of metamorpha, the, the Greek word for transformed, this metamorphosis that he's doing in each of us. And we've talked about how he wants to transform our faith and how he wants to transform our thinking and how he wants to transform our relationships. Last week, we even talked about how God cares about our health, that he cares about our physical bodies as well. He wants to see us be able to do incredible things for him. And, and a part of this is transformation of our bodies. And, and today, we're going to talk about probably one of the most important things that God has given to us, one of the best gifts that he has given to you and I, is called his church, this, this body of Christ that he's given to us. And the truth is that God wants to transform this place. I want you to know that some of the things that are happening right now at Arundel Christian Church, many of you reach out to me, you send emails, or we have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and it is incredible to hear what God is doing in and through each of you, to hear stories of life change, to see how many people we've been baptized already this year. It is incredible to see what God is doing. I believe with all of my heart that he is transforming this church. And I'm so glad that you're here because we're going to talk about how that's happening and how you can be a part of what God's doing. Here's the, the big idea for today, and it's this. We can accomplish radical things when we are provoked by a vision bigger than ourselves. Do you know this? I think you all know this to be true, that when you catch a glimpse of something that is bigger than you, when you see something that you, that you know is, is bigger than just the, the, the little dream that you have for yourself, when you catch a vision of something bigger, that when you, when you, when you get caught up in it, you, you can do radical things. Here's a great example. Like when our country, uh, the, the day that, that Pearl Harbor was bombed, Here, here's a great example. Right? This is an example of our country being provoked by, by evil. Right? Something happened, our, our boats and our, our servicemen were, were attacked with, with, by surprise, and what happened at Pearl Harbor, it caused people, there were lines outside of enlistment centers. There were lines of men who said, you know what, I want, I've been provoked, and I now see a vision bigger than myself. I see that we need to fight for the case of, of good over evil and, and fight for my country, and I, I want to line up and fight for this cause. Because that's the truth. All of us, deep down inside, when we catch a glimpse of something bigger than ourselves, it will provoke us into radical things. 
And I want to make sure we all get this because in, in Ecclesiastes, here's what it says. In, in chapter 3, it says, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. And then and this is the part, focus right here. It says, he has planted eternity in the human heart. The Bible says that deep down in every single person, if you're in this room right now and you fit in the category of human, that's all of us, God has planted eternity in you. That there is something built into the way God knit you together that you know there is something bigger than yourself. There is something, a purpose for your life bigger than just making yourself happy. There is something bigger that God has planned. He's planted it inside of each one of us. And if we can just catch a glimpse of it, if we get provoked by this thing that's bigger than us and provoke we usually give it like a bad connotation right when you provoke someone we usually assume that means something bad but do you know provoke doesn't actually mean that provoke goes both ways you can be provoked by something good to do something greater and if we can be provoked today into radical things we can see this church transform do you believe that church You know, the only way to replace the affections of our heart is by the power of a greater affection. You have to catch a glimpse for something bigger than yourself. You have to catch a glimpse for an affection greater than your own affections before you're willing to give up your affections for something else. And that is so true. And what we could do, if, if my job this morning was just to get everyone in here riled up and excited, everyone on their feet, and everyone just like, yes, we're going to go out and we're going to change this world, and God is going to transform this church. And, the, and I, one way, I, one strategy I could use is just to, to lay out the case of uh, you know, uh, statistically. I could tell you right now that there are 420,000 people in Anne Arundel County that don't know Jesus. And for some of you, you would say, yeah. Let's go do something about that. That would be enough, right? Some of you would, would be charged up by that statistic. Some of you, when I say there's four and a half billion people alive in the world right now that don't know Jesus, that, that if they were to die today, would spend an eternity apart from Jesus in a real place called hell. I, I could share that statistic. I could tell you that there's 25,000 children that are going to die today from starvation and preventable disease somewhere in the world. I, I could start spouting statistics to you, and statistics have a really powerful way of, of encouraging people towards truth and getting them kind of like, yes, yes, let's go, let's run. I see the vision, I've caught it. But the problem is, is visions that are based on just facts and statistics often are short-lived. The moment you forget that statistic, you get in your car and you drive home and you forget what number I said, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're not as encouraged to, to charge the, the gates of hell anymore. So what if instead of giving you statistics, what if we all just took a moment to catch a glimpse of something bigger than ourselves and let God do the provoking? That's what I want to do with Isaiah chapter 6. Before I even read, uh, uh, starting in, in verse 1, listen, I want you to know this. You're about to read about a, a real man named Isaiah, a prophet, who had a glimpse of something bigger than himself, Okay? But I want you to understand that this was not the first time Isaiah got a glimpse of God. This is not his first encounter with God. So if you're in this room right now and you're saying, Matt, I've already encountered God. I've already gotten a glimpse of God. I already know. Um, I feel like I've, I've been called towards this purpose. I, I get all that. Listen, Isaiah had already also had a glimpse of God. This is a story of him having a, not a, a first time encounter with God, but a fresh encounter with God. So what if everyone in this room right now could say, you know what, I want to have a fresh, for some of you, a first time encounter with God this morning, just like Isaiah did here in chapter 6. So let's, let's look at what happened to Isaiah. Starting in verse 1 through verse 4, it says, it was the year King Uzziah died, which by the way, it just means that it was in a, in a year of, of upheaval, a year of change, of uncertainty, that all this is going on in that year. It says, Isaiah saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. And if you don't know what that word means, that's all right. It's just a fancy word for an angel with six wings. It's a really cool angel. It says, attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. And with two wings, they covered their faces. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook 
the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Let me tell you the first thing that we see in those four verses that Isaiah got a glimpse of. Isaiah got a glimpse of the holiness of God. He got a glimpse of how great and mighty and holy his God was. It says in this, remember, this wasn't his first glimpse. This was a fresh glimpse. And God showed him in this moment that he was incredibly holy. In fact, you just in, in these four verses, we see different things. We see the seraphim uh, know that God is so holy that they actually can't even look at God. They cover their faces with two of their wings. That's how holy God is in this vision. It also says that the train of God's robe filled the temple. Kind of a fun fact from that, from that day and age, from Isaiah's time frame, that when a king conquered another king, they would cut off the train of that king's robe and attach it to their own. It was like a sign of, look at all the kings I've conquered. This is how powerful, how many kingdoms I am over. You would just look at how long the train of their robe was and know how mighty they were. And it says that the angels, uh, that Isaiah saw that, that God was seated on a throne, a lofty throne, and that the train of his robe filled the entire room. And that the angels were singing, holy Holy, holy. By the way, there's no other word that, that is repeated multiple times in the Bible to describe God. You don't see God is gracious, gracious, gracious. You see God is holy, holy, holy. And it says that as the angels were singing this, the, 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 the temple was being shaken to its foundation, the whole room filled with smoke. Listen, here's what you're supposed to get out of these four verses. Isaiah caught a glimpse of the holiness of God. In that moment, he saw for a fresh, uh, kind of a, not the first time, but a fresh time, the holiness of God. And this is what it caused him to do. In verse 5, it says, Then I said, this is Isaiah speaking, It is all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king the Lord of heaven's armies. I want you to understand that this is the only appropriate response that you should have when you encounter the holiness of God. When you get a glimpse, if you're in this room right now, and you've caught a glimpse of the holiness of God, the response that it's going to cause in you is this right here. It essentially, it, you will recognize in that moment that God is awesome and you are not. God is great and you are small. God is perfect and you are broken. You are going to see just the juxtaposition of how amazing God is in his holiness and what that means for you. That's the only possible solution. You can't look at God and say, I could, I could do better. Never would that happen. And Isaiah comes to the, the table and says, it's over, God. I'm doomed for I am a sinful man and I'm standing here before a holy God. There's, I'm, I'm useless, is essentially how Isaiah feels in this moment. He says, not only is he unworthy to be in God's presence, but he says, I live among people who are also filthy. I want to ask you, church, listen. When you catch a glimpse of the holiness of God, does it highlight the, the filth and the dirty in you? Because it ought to. It ought to highlight areas of your life that, that need work and need to need to be worked on. But Isaiah, isn't it great that Isaiah's glimpse didn't stop there? Because can you imagine if you came into a church on Sunday mornings and it was just like you come in, you sit down, and I open up the word and says, here, God wants you to know that you are all broken, messed up sinners. Now go away. Like that would be super discouraging, wouldn't it? Because that's not how God works. God uh, does want us to understand his holiness so we can understand our need for him. But then he, he goes on. That Isaiah's glimpse is, is bigger than that. It says not only did he get a glimpse of the holiness of God, he also gets a glimpse of the grace of God. If we keep reading at verse 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim, so one of these angels, flew to me with a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. Can you picture this in your head? The coals are so hot that he has to go over to the altar where God is seated and he, and he, he grabs a, a, a coal, burning coal from it and he brings it over to Isaiah. It says, he touched my lips with it 
And he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Let's stop there. The first part of verse 8. So, Isaiah caught a glimpse of the holiness of God. And it caused him to realize his desperate need for saving. And then he got a glimpse of the grace of God. He got a glimpse of the Savior. He caught a glimpse that God loves him so much. right? He, he, and, and many of you right now, that we're reading out of the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah. You now know in the New Testament day and age that, that God sent his son Jesus. And that through Jesus, instead of a, a coal from the altar uh, and, and us having to use a, a sacrifice on an altar to forgive us of sins, we now have the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we now have the ability to catch a glimpse of the holiness of God, but also understand and catch a glimpse of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And here's the only natural response when you've caught a glimpse of the holiness of God and you've caught a glimpse of the grace of God. There's one response that makes sense, and we see it right here, the second part of verse 8. It says, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. I want to ask you in this room, if you are a follower of Jesus and you have caught a glimpse of the holiness of God and you have caught a glimpse of the grace of God, does your life reflect that kind of attitude where you stand up and you say, God, I recognize how big you are and how small I am. And I recognize that even in in light of how great you are and how how broken I am. You have sent your son to come and die on the cross for my sins. I've caught a glimpse of your holiness. I've caught a glimpse of your grace. And now my response is naturally, here I am. What do you want me to do? And here's the really cool and powerful thing that I, I want us all to understand, that in the New Testament, God has created a, a, a strategy for us to stand up and say, here I am, send me. He's created a strategy for us to connect into the mission and vision, his heart, into what he wants us to accomplish. From the day he came to this earth and he died on the cross and he sent us out with the Great Commission, he said very specifically, here is what I want you to do. And now he's given us what it is that when we stand up and say, here I am, send me, what he's saying is, you have an opportunity now within my church to say, God, I want to be a part of what your commission is. You're sending people. That's what a commission is. The Great Commission is a sending of people. God has sent his people into the world through the Great Commission. And if we catch a glimpse of the holiness of God and catch a glimpse of the grace of God, our natural response is going to say, I want to be a part of this Great Commission. I want to be a part of the church. I want to see what the church can accomplish. Because the truth is that the holiness of God is going to clarify your position, your, your weakness, and your your need for saving, but the grace of God is going to clarify your purpose. Here's the, the kind of the big thing I want to, to wrap up with, and it's this, this statement. Hey, you know, uh, sometimes when someone gets up and they teach and they're, uh, we've been up here for longer than 10 minutes, it's easy to kind of doze off. Maybe some of you are literally dozing. Some of you are, are doodling for a moment. Um, let me just ask you to, to give me your attention one more moment. I, I really want you to catch this next thing, okay? I want you to know this thing. That you, right now in this room, are called into a movement. Do you know that? Let me ask you again. You are called into a movement. Do you know that? Let me explain what this means, okay? Because maybe you don't know that. Maybe you've never heard this before, this idea of a movement, that you don't understand what the church is. There's a really good chance that if you've been in churches for a while, you've heard a pastor or a preacher come up on stage and, and share with you that when in the New Testament, when Jesus says to Peter, Peter, by the way, means Petros, which means rock. He says to Peter, Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build my what? I'm going to build my church, right? And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. When he says that word, it's the, the Greek word, ekklesia. And this word, ekklesia, we understand that it means not four walls. He's not saying, and on this rock, I'm going to build this building at you know, 710 Aquahar Road, and they're going to call it Arundel Christian Church. No, that's not what he's talking about. He says, on this rock, I'm going to build this body of believers to take my great commission out into the world. 
That's what he's talking about. It's a, it's, we, you've heard us say before that you are the church. You and I, together, we make up the church. It's a body of believers. But even more than that, I want you to know that that word ecclesia actually means even more than just a body of believers. It actually, when Jesus said this to Peter, what he said was, Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock, I am going to start a movement. With you, Peter, I'm going to start this thing, and this church is going to be a movement that, that, that 2,000 years from now, there's going to be little versions of it all over the globe who are, who are preaching out of this book and talking about me and sharing my good news. There's a movement that's going to start with you, Peter. And I want you to know that God is calling you into this movement. If you're not already a part of the movement, he wants you to be a part of the movement in fact, we see in, in, in Acts, right, as the early story of the church, that the Lord was adding to their number daily. Every day, the, the Lord was adding to the number of those who were being saved. God is calling you into something bigger than yourself. And if you can be provoked this morning by a, the vision of the holiness of God and, and a glimpse of the grace of God, it will cause you, listen, the natural reaction is going to be to stand up and say, I want to be a part of your movement. I want to be sent. Here I am, send me. So as we were talking through this, this week, I was like, you know, what if we did something a little different? Do you think the church would be gracious enough to allow us to do something a little different? I know we did something a little different last week, and now it's two weeks in a row, we're going to do something a little different. So thank you for your grace. But here's, here's what I, I, normally we do like three songs at the beginning and one song at the end. And so what if we cut one of the songs at the beginning and the song at the end and had a little bit more time to do something a little creative together as a church today? What if I, I'm going to get up, I'm going to teach and, and share uh, that if we catch a glimpse of the holiness of God and catch a glimpse of the grace of God, that it's going to call us into wanting to be a part of uh, the sending of God, the, this thing called the church. What if we now did something that, that we normally do after church downstairs called Starting Point. You know, many of you uh, have been a part of Starting Point. Most of you haven't. So I said, what, what if we do like a, 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 a real quick version of Starting Point together as a church? Uh, so I'm going to invite Pastor Dustin to come and join me on stage. And uh, we want to share some things out of this book with you. Hand, if you have that, will you hold it up for a moment? Uh, it looks like that... But let me share with you, uh, you know, every time I teach, I share what we call what, what now, God. It's a three-word prayer that I want to invite you into. And our what now, God, is, is simple. I want to invite you to, to make two decisions this morning. Number one, I want to invite you to catch a glimpse of God's holiness and God's grace. I want to, whether you're pre-Christ or you've been a Christian your whole life, as far back as you can remember, I want to invite you to catch a fresh glimpse of God's holiness and grace. And number two, based on that, I want you to stand up and become a part of the movement. I want you to say, you know what? Here I am, God, send me. Because here's, here's what we noticed as a staff. We have uh, this, this thing that we do here called partnering. It's, it's called partnership. And we invite people to become a partner here. If you're part of another church or you've been part of another church for a while, you know that uh, other churches sometimes call this membership. And churches will invite you into membership or invite you into partnership. And essentially, this is your way of saying, I don't want to sit on the sidelines anymore. I don't want to just show up here, but I want to be actually a, a part of what God's doing here. This is your way of standing up and saying, here I am, send me. So in order to make that possible for you, we want to share with you uh, out of this book. So grab it and turn into uh, it with me to page four and five, you'll notice two things right away. Uh, page four and five, these pages were designed and printed uh, when I still had hair. Uh, that's the first thing you're going to notice. Uh, the other thing you're going to notice, uh, that the wall was green uh, about a year and a half ago. It's been blue for quite a while. But the information on here has not changed. And here's what I want to share with you. How many of you, just raise your hand real fast, you've ever heard us say the phrase, you belong at ACC? Should be most every hand. We say it, I already said it today, so everyone should have uh, heard it. But anyway, here's what we mean by you belong at ACC. We have three ways that you can belong. 
And for more than half of you in this room right now, you fit into the category of attending, meaning you show up to ACC, uh, we allow people to attend everything we do. You can attend our life groups, you can attend our growth courses, you can attend our events, you can attend on Sunday morning. If you are in this room right now as an attender, uh, that's not bad, we're really glad that you're here. You belong here, we're glad that you're here. What we want to ask you to consider doing today, though, is this. That if you can say yes to these five things that we're going to put up on the screen, all right, it's these five things, that you are a follower of Jesus who's been baptized by immersion, that you've read our essentials of the faith and that you agree with them, that you agree not to be divisive, and that you embrace the strategy of our church, which we call a fishing boat model. We'll talk about that more here in a moment. If you can say yes to those five things, Why in the world would you want to sit on the sidelines as God's people who've caught a glimpse of his holiness and grace are saying, here I am, send me. Like why why watch other people go when you could be a part of what God's doing here? So I want to invite you to consider today. Here's my my number one goal. I'm going to put my cards out on the table. My goal is that for those of you in this room right now who aren't partners at ACC might choose to become partners today before you leave. That's why I'm doing this. Now, Dustin's going to share with you some other next steps and some other things that you can do, and all of those are good things, but kind of the big picture is is that. So uh, would you share with us a little bit in more detail um, some other stuff from the book? Yeah, yeah. So if you all will turn with me over to page six in the book, we're going to talk for a second about our mission and vision, and I think these things can get a little muddy sometimes. People are kind of confused about what's the difference between a mission and and a vision. Well, our vision is kind of what, our, what we're after, what our end goal is. And our mission is how we're going, how we plan on getting there. And so I want to start with our, our mission at the top of page six is to uh, very simply love God, love people, and serve our community. If you've been around ACC for just a, a little bit or, or longer, you recognize that there's a lot happening in this building throughout the week. And there are opportunities for us as a church to serve our community. And the way that we do that is we, lo- we, love our, we love people as much as we can, and we love God as much as we can, and we serve them. And, and, and that's always happening. That mission is always happening uh, in this building at all times. And the reason that that's always happening is our vision. Now, you'll notice on page six that the vision that's printed in this book has changed recently. Uh, and it's not necessarily a different vision. It's just a more refined vision. It's more uh, refined of why we do what we do. And, every, and you'll hear us say it often from stage at least once uh, every Sunday. You'll hear us say that ACC exists to see, uh, pe- see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. And what that means is that we believe that the love of Jesus is so powerful that it changes people's lives. And that's why we're here, that's why we exist, that's why we do what we do. And the second part of that um, is, is the word release. And what we loved when we were kind of brainstorming through this, this phrase together as a leadership team and the overseers is we, what we loved is that when we said, hey, what does released mean to you? That we got two answers and they were both awesome. And so we adopted both of those definitions and said, yeah, this is going to be a word that has dual meaning the entire time that we use this vision statement. That we want to see people transformed, right? We want to see them changed Uh, into who God wants them to be, but we also want to release them by the love of Jesus. And that means two things. Number one, we read here today that God, when God calls you and you catch a glimpse of that vision that he's called you to, that he then asks you to go. He says, here I am, now send me. Or we read in the New Testament in the Great Commission that God says, go and make disciples. And so that releasing is us saying, yeah, you've been changed by Jesus, now go and do the work of the Lord. But another really cool uh, def- uh, definition that, hit, that hides behind that word released is that when some of us, when we come into our relationship with the Lord, we don't come in clean, right? We don't come in fresh with all of our problems solved, but we often bring in things that have kind of bound us uh, in, in our lives. I mean, some sin issues or some addictions or whatever, something has bound us and we can't break free from it. And what we know is that when God transforms you by his love, that he also releases you of those bounds. Amen. And that's what we love, the meaning of our vision. And so I want to hand it back off to Matt. He's going to talk about that fishing boat model that we mentioned a minute ago. Yeah, so I want to ask you, uh, we, we have, uh, we're going to need your help here in a minute, okay? Because Pastor Dustin and I recognized last service that neither of us have ever been on a cruise ship before. Right. So in that problem, maybe you can help us. How many of you, just a show of your hands, have been on a cruise before? You've been on a cruise ship 
And now, those of you, I'm going to need your help, all right? You don't have to keep your hand up, but I want you to share with Dustin and I some, some words that describe how awesome a cruise ship is. So s- somebody shout something out. All right. Food to eat? Yeah. All the food you can imagine, <laughs> food to eat. I, I, uh, my, my life group leader, Matt Hannikin, I don't know if you guys know Matt, but he told us uh, one time he was on a cruise ship, and he, as a joke, told the waiter the first day he was looking at the menu, and he just handed the menu back and said, yes, please. <clears throat> and they brought him one of everything on the menu. So, yeah, plenty of food to eat, all you can eat. What else? What? They're huge, right? They're really big. Entertainment. (laughs) Childcare. (laughs) Melissa. That might be the number one reason for anyone to ever go on a cruise. (laughs) I heard they had childcare. I don't know. We're signed up. Childcare. So let me give you, anyone else want to add one out we haven't heard yet? Entertainment, food. Drinks. All right, yeah. All all you can drink. And what else? Relaxation. Relaxation. Yeah, so basically, here's, here's the, you guys have all done an incredible job convincing me that my wife and I ought to go on a cruise, so uh, we're going to do that soon. But here, here's the deal. Um, cruise ships are designed with you in mind. They're designed around you and your comfort and your relaxation, which is, by the way, I'm not knocking on that. I think that's a really good thing when uh, you're like on vacation and need to unwind and all that, when you kind of earn that, that little bit of downtime what a great thing to, to invest in. But how is that different than a fishing boat? Yeah, so fishing boats obviously are super smelly. Not quite as big. I know someone said the cruise ships are huge. They're not quite as big. Uh, everyone has a job to do. Um, there's no rest or relaxation. You don't have like your own private room. No one comes and waits on you. You, don't ha- you don't, can't say yes, please. Uh, it's just do as you're told. <laughs> you know? uh, so there's, you're, you're there for one specific, specific purpose, and that's to catch fish. Yeah, so the mission of a fishing boat is totally different, right? Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, the, the mission of a fishing boat is essentially to catch fish, right? That's The fishing boat's purpose is not to make you comfortable. It's not to entertain you. There's no shows. There's no magic. There's no comedy. There's no all-you-can-eat buffet on a fishing boat. A fishing boat has a very clear purpose, and it's to put everyone on board to work to accomplish the purpose of catching fish. And God has called his church to be fishers of men, that that's what we're called into, So I want to just say really clearly about the strategy of this church. When we talk about this model of this fishing boat, if you're looking for a church where the music is always perfect and entertaining to you and the chairs are always comfortable and the carpets are always clean and nobody's going to ask you to lift a finger and everything is going to be uh, hunky-dory and it's not going to ever smell weird in here, if that's what you're looking for, this is not the place for you. Because God has not called us to be that kind of church. He has not called us to be a cruise ship. He's called us to roll up our sleeves and to say, here I am, send me. I want to catch fish. I want to I teach people about the love of Jesus. And if it's a little messy, if it gets a little dirty, if i got to invest some of my resources into this to make this happen, I, I want to be on this boat. Let's go get to work. And that's a little bit more about our model on page six. All right, page seven, I'm not going to go into detail. We have some text here for you about our story. We're an independent, non-denominational church. And if you have more questions about that, ask me later. Let me share with you really briefly about our leadership structure. Um, I know we're, this is kind of, you. all of you are thinking, Matt, I did not sign up for this this morning. Um, Thank you for being gracious with us. I want to share this with you. Another hidden reason why, by the way, is we have uh, 700 of these books, and they're out of date now. So we're like, hey, let's get rid of them. So (laughs) keep your book. You get to have it. But here, let me me share with you our our leadership. Number one, Jesus is the head of the church. The Bible is really clear. Everything we do is under the direction of of his scriptures and the way Jesus has asked us to to function and, and operate as a church. So Jesus is the head. Underneath Jesus is a team we call our overseers. You might come from a church model that uses the word elders. Uh, This is essentially a team of elders, of overseers, who help. uh, Here's what they do. When you're on a fishing boat, uh, the, the elders would be the ones who say, here's where the fishing boat needs to go. Here's where the fishing boat needs to be in three years. So our overseers direct Uh, Make sure that our staff and our servant leaders know where they're going and how to get there. 
Uh, they, they kind of give us that long-term vision. They set our budgets every year. They, they help us hire and fire staff. Uh, all of those big things are done by the overseers. All right, now, 95% of the decisions, the day-to-day operations, are done by our staff. Uh, Dustin is on our staff, and I'm on our staff, and we have uh, 11 others on our staff. And our staff, uh, both full-time and part-time people, help us to accomplish the, the mission and vision that the overseers and Jesus have set for us. Remember, the overseers are, are catching the glimpse of the vision from Jesus, who's the head, and passing along to the staff, and we're paid to get us to that location. Now, this last one is what we call our servant leaders. If, if you study Greek at all, you know that servant leader uh, comes from the Greek word diakonos. A lot of churches use the word deacon. Deacon comes from diakonos. So deacon, servant leader, basically the same thing. We have a team of servant leaders at this church that if they weren't part of what ha- was happening on a daily basis, this, they're, they're, they're pillars. They, they support this church. If they were to just stop doing what they do, this place would be a hot mess, I'm telling you. This fishing boat would stink. I'm telling you right now. In fact, would you guys do me a favor? There are uh, life group leaders, uh, ministry team leaders, growth course uh, coaches or teachers. All of the people that do all those things are fit into that, that servant leaders category. Would you do me a favor and thank them with your applause and just letting that team know? And by the way, on that list are servant leaders and our overseers and our Lord. None of them are paid uh, for what they do. Uh, Only your staff are are paid to accomplish uh, what what the overseers and Jesus have given us to do. So I want you to know about that structure. Uh, We also want to tell you about what we call our five catalysts. And Dustin's going to kind of walk us through these five things. Uh, Just for the sake of time, for those of you who are thinking, this isn't normal. I don't, my body doesn't know when lunch is coming. Uh, We have five catalysts we're going to talk through. And then we're going to be pretty much done. So we're going to talk through these five, and uh, it's good. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So at ACC, there are five things, five ingredients, if you will, that uh, propel us forward in our faith. You might hear a lot of churches talk about they have five purposes or five pillars or five whatever. Ours are, we call them catalysts because these are the ingredients that we add that spur on a change. And so what I want to be super clear about before we get into these five is that if you're considering with the goal we said up front and honest with you, our goal today is to take you from being just an attender to being a partner to saying, here I am, send me. I want to be super clear up front that if you uh, want to be a partner, we're not saying that you have to uh, have accomplished all five of these catalysts or arrived in some way, all five of these catalysts in, in order for you to become a partner. What we are saying is that if you do become a partner, these are the five things that we are going to encourage you in and walk alongside you in, uh, in your faith and in your journey uh, with Jesus. And so there are five things you can see here on page 11, worship regularly, connect relationally, grow personally, serve sacrificially, and give generously. We'll start on page 12 with worship regularly. It sounds uh, pretty simple, and it is. Uh, What we're saying is that if you're um, committing to growing in your faith at ACC, uh, we, the, we believe that the best way to do that is to have a regular practice of it. Uh, regularly attending services here uh, is a part of that. And so there are a couple of questions here on the bottom of page 12 that I would encourage you to ask yourself. Am I attending church regularly to support my faith development? Or does the weather outside determine whether or not I go to church? See, worshiping regularly is an important ingredient to propel you forward Uh, in your faith. If you turn over with me to page uh, 14, you'll see that on that spread is our most important, uh, what we would say is our most important, the most talked about catalyst uh, that we have here at ACC, and it's connect relationally. And what we mean by that specifically is our life groups, and we'll talk about what that looks like. But at ACC, we're not just a church that offers life groups. We're not just a church with life groups. We are a church made up of life groups. So we're an ACC is not a church with life groups. We are a church of life groups. Can we say that together? Yeah. Let's do that. ACC ACC is is not not a church church with with life life groups. groups. We We are a church church of life groups. And so what that looks like and why that's so important is because if if, if you are uh, entering into, into this faith journey, uh, with us. We want to surround you 
uh, with people who are just like you, who are going through these things just like you're going through these things in the same phase of life and the same kind of scenarios that they're walking through and growing and, and learning in. And that's what happens in life groups. They meet all throughout the week in homes all over the county. And it's an opportunity for you to sit down and make some friends and grow some relationships and have an opportunity to have a community of people around you uh, to grow in your faith with and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. And the person over there says, I just came out of that. Let me lift you up and, and, and walk you through this together. We can do life together. That's why it's called a life group. As you can see, there are next steps there on page 15. We would encourage you, if you're interested in joining a, a life group or you want more information about leading a life group, you can mark that on your next step card. Or you can see how you can do that online as well. If you turn over with me to page 16 and 17, this is our third catalyst, uh, Grow Personally. This is one that we're talking heavily about uh, in this new year. It's one that we've noticed over the past couple of years that we haven't been doing a great job at helping you grow personally. And so this year, one of the ways we're doing that, you can see on page 16, there are several ways that ACC helps you grow. Uh, and the last one there on the list is growth courses. These are uh, topical courses that may last just a few weeks uh, in the evenings. Most of them uh, end up being on Sunday nights. Some are other different times of the week. We're finishing up next week. Uh, we're finishing up a growth course on mental health. Uh, at the same time, next week, we're launching the Phases, which is a parenting growth course as well. You saw the video for that earlier. So there are 20 different growth course opportunities for you. Uh, uh, here at ACC in 2020. That's our commitment. Um, you can get more information about that online at arundelcc.org slash growth. You'll see that link on the bottom of page 17, or you can mark it on your next step card that's in the back of your book as well. Uh, practical messages. We want to make sure all of our messages have an actual practical takeaway that we're not just uh, regurgitating some spiritual garb every week and, and just kind of reading scripture stuff that you could do on your own at home or saying a bunch of words up here to make us sound smart. We want to give you something that actually you can take from scripture and apply to your life where you are today. Um, life groups, we talked about that a second ago. And then Bibles, you heard Matt mention at the beginning of his message, if you don't own a Bible, there are Bibles in, underneath the seat in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, you can take that Bible that's under the seat in front of you, write your name in it and take it home. We want to make sure that everybody has a Bible because we believe uh, that's the true word of God. And that's how he speaks to us. And that's how our lives are transformed and released by his love. Okay. I know we're rolling right through this, but we want to be um, super uh, sensitive to your time and know that your bellies are probably growling a little bit by now. Uh, the fourth one on page 18, serve sacrificially. Now, I know you might be okay with coming to church. You might be okay with connecting in a life group, and uh, you might be okay with signing up for some growth courses. And another, another thing we're going to encourage you, and again, you don't have to already be serving in order to become a partner, but if you do become a partner, we're going to ask you to consider a role on the fishing boat. We're going to ask you to consider serving somewhere uh, to help propel forward the vision by the mission that we have here at ACC. And so that's what serving sacrificially looks like. You can find uh, uh, more information about how to serve or how to get plugged in or, or fill out our form to, to get more information about how to serve. You can see that on the bottom of page 18, rundlecc.org slash serve. Or again, you can mark it on this next step card that was inside of your book today. Um, the last one I want to talk about just for a moment is on page 20. This is our fifth catalyst, and it's called Give Generously. We, we know that, um, that God recognizes uh, that us and our humanity, that we are our money is closely associated or closely tied and connected with our hearts. And that if we can become a generous person who says, uh, what I have isn't just mine, but what I have is a gift from God, and it doesn't really belong to me to begin with, um, and open our hands up to what God wants to use that resource for. He knows that it can change our hearts. It can transform and release us by his love. And so at ACC, our fifth catalyst, our fifth ingredient to propel you forward in your faith is this thing called giving generously. And there's a, a next step there that I would love to challenge you with just personally to take the giving challenge uh, in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, God says to test uh, him and see if you don't believe in this giving thing. And if you're like, hey, I can't live on 90% of, of, of my budget. There's just no way that it would work out. We wouldn't have bills that would pay. God says in his word, in the Bible, it says in Malachi, God says, hey, just test me in this whole giving thing. And so at ACC, we come alongside you and we ask you to test 
God in that giving thing. And if you would give to ACC for 90 days and you would give that full tithe, that full 10% over 90 days. And at the end of that 90 days, you're like, God didn't prove himself true. I don't know what he was talking about. I need my money back. We will give you every dime, every penny of that money that you gave to us over the span of 90 days. And we do that because we believe uh, that God's word is true. And if he says to test him in that and see if your blessings won't be more than what you originally thought they could be, uh, then we want to partner along with God in that and have you get, take that giving challenge. You can do that online or you can also mark that on your next step card or if you're interested in reoccurring giving as well. Uh, lastly, page 24 and 25, I want to wrap up my time by talking about our ministries. Um, there are lots of things over there on page 24, but I specifically want to call out a couple of things on page 25 because you might often hear us say these phrases and I want you to be like, I don't know what that means. So when we say kid point, that's our kids ministry. So birth all the way through fifth grade and uh, our children's ministry director, Jen Dunning, does an excellent job. The entire second floor of our building is for them. If you're bringing your kids into this service and their ages and their through birth through fifth grade, I'm just telling you right now, you're, 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 you're keeping them from experiencing something more amazing and getting more out uh, and understanding of the scriptures than what we can offer them in this room. And so they have a, a brand new program up there now just specifically for fourth and fifth graders called Zone 4.5. That happens during the service in here as well. So I would highly encourage you to have your kids try out Kid Point on a Sunday. They will have way more fun in there than they will in here, and they'll learn a lot more at their level than they will in here as well. Secondly, on page 25 is this thing called Remix. It's what we call our youth ministry or our teen ministry, our, 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 our ministry to teens, so 6th grade through 12th grade is Remix ministry. That happens in this building on our third floor, technically all over the place in this building. It's pretty nuts in here, but it happens mostly on the third floor of this building on Sunday nights, and that's what Remix is. It's our middle school, high school uh, ministry, and they have an amazing time up there. That's all my stuff, I think, for now. Thank you. Hey, uh, <clears throat> I didn't get applause, so uh, good job. <clears throat> um, we're going to find on page 26 and 27, you're going to read on your own, those are essentials of faith, and it essentially lands right here at the end of our, at the end of our book and says, you belong at ACC. I want to ask you uh, to, to stand on your feet if... You've caught a glimpse of the holiness of God, and you've caught a glimpse of the grace of God, and you want to stand up and say, you know what, here I am, send me. I want to ask you to stand up on your feet for a moment, because I'm going to pray for you. Stand on your feet. If you have caught a glimpse of the holiness of God, and you've caught a glimpse of the grace of God, some of you right now are like, if I stand, I think I'm becoming a partner. That's not what I'm doing right now, all right? I'm not tricking anybody, all right? If you've caught a glimpse of the grace of God and you've got a glimpse of the holiness of God, I'm not asking you to join by standing right now. I'm just saying I want you to stand because I'm going to say a prayer over you. But for those of you who are standing, listen, I do want to invite you to consider on your way out today a dropping our partnership kind of next step. This is this little bottom part here in a bucket on your way out saying, you know, I don't want to sit on the sidelines anymore. I, I don't want to just uh, kind of attend. I've been... I've, I've got a glimpse of the grace of God and the, the holiness of God, and, and I've been given my life to Jesus, and I've been baptized by murder. I want to be a part of what God's doing here. I want to invite you into that. And by the way, there's some of you in this room that think you already are a partner, so you're not going to turn this in, because you, in your head, you are already a partner at ACC. Half of you that think that right now, if I were to log into our system, you're just in a tender, because you've never told us that you wanted to be a partner with us. So maybe you're already a partner as far as you know. Why not tell us again, just in case, that you still long to be a partner here? That would be an awesome thing. Let me pray over you. Uh, let me uh, thank you for, for your, your glimpses that you received today. And let me pray for everyone in this room. Uh, God, we are so thankful for all that you do. God, for those in this room right now who uh, have not yet maybe caught a glimpse of your holiness, have not yet caught a glimpse of your grace, God, I pray over them. Uh, that they would recognize the truth of who you are and that they would have the, that movement that makes them want to say, God, here I am, send me. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And God, I also ask that uh, all the people who are standing right now who recognize the, the holiness that, 
that, that causes them to recognize their, their desperate need for you, and, and yet they also recognize the fact that you sent your son to this earth as a free act of grace for them. That that would propel them into movement, that they would join into the movement of the church, that the Great Commission would be so exciting and contagious to everyone in this room standing right now that they would say, God, I am ready to do whatever it is you want me to do. And we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.